Good day, Internet. Good day, Internet. Good day, Internet. Oh, my friends, it's Monday, and I was about to despair. I was about to say, no, I can't do it. It's Monday. And then I remember Chris Ashley was on the show today, and it just got me back up and pumped. That's right. I stepped in the house, and I looked around. I was like, man, this place looks familiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. You've been you've been running this town. This is hey, great. It's all good. I'm happy to be here. Thank yeah, you. I'm glad I'm glad uh, that that you've been able to to help us out so much uh, lately. It's awesome, man. If it wasn't so fun, I'd be like, ah, oh, man, stub <laughs> my toe. I can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> good thing. Good thing. All right, we ready to go? Yeah, let's do it. Yes, let's get rolling in three, two. This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you. That includes Reed Fishler. You know who you are. Larry Bailey. You too. Michelle Sergio. You're the best. And new patrons. Welcome Osama and T.S. Bob. On this episode of DTNS, Getty Images plays it safe with AI. iFixit tears down the new iPhone. We'll tell you what they found inside. And you can now talk to chat GPT with your voice and it'll talk right back to you. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, September 25th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And somewhere around your nation's capital, right to your backyard, your boy, Chris Ashley. And I'm the show's producer, Roger J. Chris, you said your nation's capital, but what if someone's in like Belgium? Well, you know what? Chris, let's <laughs> pretend. You're right. <laughs> your favorite nation no no i'm not gonna say no, i can't even say that either <laughs> yeah i have to fix it i forget uh no it's good to have you chris ashley uh welcome back again it's thank awesome. you thank you thank you it is uh it's free preview week by the yeah, way yeah this is uh, awesome it's a perfect week so everybody can see what yeah. kind of foolishness goes on in here yeah. now i was telling you earlier i wish people could see more people should see the foolishness that goes on in the background mm. so yeah, you know, so you got you guys got to see this awesomeness that is this show. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Uh, let's get right on to the quick hits. If you're wondering, hey, who's providing the AI for those Amazon upgrades to the smart assistant that we mentioned last week? Well, sounds like it's at least in part Anthropic, makers of the Claude chatbot. Amazon is going to take a $1.25 billion minority stake in Anthropic with an option to increase that to $4 billion if they want. Google also has an investment in Anthropic, so it's not like Amazon's slowly going to take it over, uh, at least not without Google cooperating. Anthropic will use AWS as its cloud provider, including AWS Trainium and Inferentia chips for running its models, and AWS customers will get access to Anthropic's models. And while those guys are in investing outside, Huawei has decided to invest mm -hmm. inside and created its own 5G chip in response to restrictions on 5G equipment and technology by the U.S. But a launch event Monday, the company did not mention the 5G chip on the Mate 60 Pro phone in which it ships. Huawei did announce a sedan, a high-end SUV, electric cars, new wireless earbuds, a smartwatch, a tablet, and more. Yeah, it was a big old announcement for them, but no mention of that 5G. I didn't want yeah. to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, imagine the world. Well, sorry. No, just, no, no. Go ahead. They just blew my mind that they, those are some really cool things to announce. And they're, everybody's upset that they didn't announce a chip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Electric cars, whatever. <laughs> uh, Meta's Connect conference is coming this Wednesday, and the Wall Street Journal says it has seen some internal chats indicating that one of the announcements will be Gen AI personas like generation ai like gen z but ai anyway they're chat bots geared toward engaging the youths one of them is apparently a sassy robot inspired by bender from the tv show futurama uh does this sound cringy i don't know we'll find out wednesday i guess well hopefully pegatron has the same resilience as meta because they've announced that they've uh canceled all three shifts at his plants in tamil nadu due to a fire Pegatron makes iPhones for Apple and told Reuters it did not expect any significant financial or operational impact. That's good. It's good that it said that. But yeah, if there's a little delay in shipping, now you might know what. Yeah, I'm wondering how they on. pull that off. Maybe it's insurance. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, or maybe it wasn't as bad as it looked and they're just being overcautious. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, speaking of India, Bloomberg sources say India will loosen planned restrictions on imports of laptops, tablets, and other hardware to give companies time to prepare for those restrictions. Remember, they were going to require you to make most of your laptops in India and then have to get a license if you're going to import them. They're, they're loosening that up. Companies now just need to register with an import management system starting November 1st, but they won't have to limit the imports yet. Yet, as companies begin manufacturing more devices inside India, then India says the limits will slowly kick in again, according to these sources. Yeah. All right. So we, we talked a while back on DTNS about Getty Images saying it would not use AI in any of its products until it understood the legal risks. Uh, apparently, they have finished figuring out the legal risks and Getty Images worked out the details for generative AI by Getty Images. They're partnering with NVIDIA on this. It is trained exclusively on Getty's library of licensed photos. That's meant to prevent questions of copyright that exist on models trained on data taken from the open internet. Getty's like, we have the rights to all this stuff, so there's no question that we have the rights. We're not training it on anything else. But that also means the Getty model was trained on a more limited data set. Now, Understand that photos created with the tool will not be included in stock content libraries from Getty Images or iStock, and Getty will pay creators if it uses their images to train its model, sharing revenue generated from the tool. The tool also actively prevents you from naming actual people in its prompts later this year. Getty will add the ability for customers to add their own data to the model to generate images in their brand style. This is uh this is similar to what Adobe's been doing with Firefly, where they they trained it on their own licensed images from Creative Suite and Creative Cloud. Um, Microsoft uh, recently announced it's going to foot any copyright legal bills for its clients, even though they're using OpenAI's products, which were trained on the open internet. Everybody's taking a different approach to this, but Getty's taken one of the more conservative ones, and. I wonder what you think of the trade-off here, Chris, because on the one hand, it sounds like they're leaning towards being ethical, saying, you know, we're not we're not an, uh, ethical, but also avoiding lawsuits. We're not going to risk, you know, violating someone's copyright uh, and, and have to test fair use in this totally new arena of legal questions. But it also means that you won't be able to do as much with this tool because it's limited to that data set. I think this is one of the best examples in tech, at least, of threading the needle I've seen in a while, <laughs> because I, I think this is like a really good position to put themselves in. They really kind of shored up themselves from being sued. They also announced before anybody had questions about it that they will take care of anybody whose images are, are leveraged in this in endeavor. And they provide a service that a lot of people could benefit from. I, I mean, I, I don't see any wrong in this. And even if the limited uh, uh, nature or, or data points, the reality is this is still pretty limited in, in general. You know what I mean? As, as far as how good the images work uh, or look. And so far, it seems like these images are, have improved over the previous time. So I, I think this is actually a really good uh, start. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it in that way. Because it's limited, it actually might be better at what it does. Uh, I know the the Verge uh, t took it for a test run and said it did seem really good at creating stock photo-like images. Mm -hmm. uh, they did one with a ballerina in there, and they said, yeah, it didn't have six arms <laughs> and six <laughs> legs. It, it looked like a stock image ballerina. They said the illustrations weren't as good. Mm -hmm. Uh, the photo, the photorealistic stuff was good. The, the, the illustration stuff didn't, didn't work as well for them, but maybe that's why Getty wants to let you add your own data to the model. So you could you could say, Hey, we own this logo, please train on that. And then we can manipulate that and work right. it into illustrations and stuff. Uh, but yeah, maybe this will be better for its purpose. Yeah. And the thing is, I have to admit, um, I never really appreciated this, this service to begin with. <clears throat> I never thought it was a big deal. It's like, who cares? But I tell you what's made me um, kind of come around on this is just playing Starfield. You know, this game is massive, massive, massive game. And um, what I'm noticing is quite a few characters, <laughs> uh, 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 NPCs look alike. And I'm like, how mm -hmm. awesome would they have benefited 
uh, from being able to use this just to give us some more variation. Now, I, I'm not blaming them. It's a massive game. You have a lot of characters, but I could just see the potential in something like this. Man, we've always talked about movies and stuff like this. But, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I would have really loved to see some a, a, le- a little bit more variation in a lot of the character images in this game. Yeah, and I, and I think you're right that Getty is smart here to say, look, what people use this for is stock images. Uh, and even if our data set is limited to stock images, well, that's what our tool is for. We don't need our AI to be able to make other things to come up with other uses. We're not trying to be open AI. We're not trying to be an innovative edge case. Uh, we're just trying to make our stock image thing better. And so if we can train it on stock images so it makes great stock images, well, it may be better at that than ChatGPT or not ChatGPT Dolly, uh, because it's it's more specifically trained and it exposes them to less legal risk. And you know, we'll we'll see what the checks look like, but they're right. paying the artists whose images were used to train this. So theoretically, everybody wins here. Yeah, and uh, we should not understate the fact that they said they're not going to use generated images to train on because somebody has the same paranoia I, I have as the computer taking over. Yeah. Uh, we still don't know how much this is going to cost. Uh, yeah, you true. will get a, a perpetual worldwide unlimited right to the image, just like you you would if you do a royalty free image. Uh, so that's nice. You, you get the maximal rights out of this and they're going to have an API so you can integrate it into workflow. So yeah, uh, yeah once, once we know how much it is and it won't be cheap because it's Getty, but hopefully it's reasonable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it'll be good. All right, folks, with every new Apple iPhone comes a new iFixit teardown, uh, where we find out a little bit about what's inside that iPhone, get an assessment of repairability. Here are some of the findings. The 15 Pro has the Qualcomm Snapdragon X70 5G modem in it. Uh, we, We had heard that Apple was not using its own modem tech yet, and this confirms that. Uh, the Snapdragon X70 uses a little AI to improve speed and latency. And, and apparently this, this modem delivers. A lot of people have already done speed tests and found that it is faster on the same 5G network as a 14 because of the modem. Uh, also a tiny bit bigger battery, 4,422 milliamp hour battery confirmed by iFixit. And it keeps something called the mid frame from the iPhone 14. The mid frame is a frame inside the phone that allows you to open the phone from either side, front or back, and access the components. Basically, the components are mounted to the mid-frame. Uh, you could also think of it as a central chassis. I fix it refer- refers to it that way as well. The only downside here is the 15 Pro has it, but the components are all on the display side. So if you remove the screen, to replace the battery, which you would have to do with the 15 Pro, don't have to do that with the regular 15, just the 15 Pro, you're, it's a trickier operation. If, if you screw up a little when you're removing the glass, you're less likely to ha- make any kind of permanent damage than if you mess with the screen. Uh, but I fix it still gives them credit. Like the fact that you can come at it from either side is still an improvement. The big ding on this is parts pairing. Parts pairing is something that's not new. They did this with the 14 as well, but it means you need to buy your parts from Apple or they will not have all the functionality that a part should have. You not only have to buy the part from Apple, you also have to verify your repair through Apple technical support. And because of that, some repairs just don't work. Some do. Uh, but some don't unless you're getting that part from Apple. Uh, iFixit took the LiDAR sensor out of an iPhone 15 Pro. So this wasn't like some weird third-party cheap part. They took it out of an iPhone 15 Pro, put it in another iPhone 15 Pro, and the camera app kept crashing because that LiDAR sensor was not properly paired. It was all a software problem, not a hardware problem. So the upshot is, the iPhone is easier to repair than it used to be, but software makes that ease contingent on involving Apple in your repairs for parts and verification. So iFixit says we would give it a seven out of 10, which is a really high repairability score. It's much more modular. Even the microphone is now modular, but because you have to go through Apple for so many things to make stuff work, they're giving it a four out of 10, Chris. Yeah. The one thing I want to do is make sure people pay attention to why these type of breakdowns are important because you really want to understand, A, can you get your phone fixed or are you stuck, you know, turning it in and getting another phone? B, are you getting what you pay for? You know, so I, I think sometimes 
uh, people may hear these type of iFixit articles, but never really actually appreciate why it's important for that, what these guys do. So I just wanted to take a second and, and put that out of there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If, if you have Apple care and you're never going to take your phone to be fixed anywhere, but an Apple store, none of this matters to you. This matters to the people who either want to fix it themselves. And there's a lot of you out there who want to do that, or you want to be, have the option to go to a third party because it's, it's more convenient. Maybe you don't have an Apple store close to you, uh, or it's cheaper, uh, or because you just need a display swapped out or something. Yep, out of warranty, all of those things come into play there. So yeah. Um, so now let's talk about the substance of this. I, I you know, I I don't want I don't think people should right out of the gate uh beat Apple up for some of the design decisions here because unfortunately I fix it doesn't know. And I wish they would kind of be up more just kind of make that a little bit more obvious is like, you know, why they may have went this way, why they didn't, mm -hmm. you know, did they ask why they guys went this way versus not, not that way? Um, it, you know, it, on the, on the face of it, yeah, it definitely sounds like maybe an added step to put in there to kind of corner the repair market. Um, that would be an obvious and you'd be naive not to think at least have that in your mind, but who knows, maybe there's a, uh, you know, Apple has a reputation to protect, you know? And so if there are people out there fixing these phones or, it, and then, you know, putting it in janky parts and then selling them people aren't going to say hey janky part dealer uh you broke my phone they're going to go blame apple for that so yeah, it's kind yeah. of a catch-22 when it comes to some of this stuff especially when you have a brand as big as theirs to protect at this point so uh, i just I, yeah yeah go ahead no no i was just gonna say i i, I fix it does uh refer to the fact that they think what Apple's doing with the parts pairing is saying, well, you won't possibly uh, make your repair to the precision we require uh, if you don't use our parts and go through our validation system. And iFix, it's like, you know what? Not every repair needs to be as precise as the factory, right? Yeah. Like, it's very Apple to be like, yeah, but it won't be perfect. We need to keep it, make it perfect. Uh, and, maybe, you know, it doesn't always have to be. It just needs to work. Right. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of us have that same uh, threshold. <laughs> it's like uh, building a, a, a cutting board and building a house. This is like, yeah, big difference. They're two different things. Yeah. <laughs> two different tolerances. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. It's spoken from experience right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, I feel like, uh, I feel like I fix it does a pretty good job of, of, of giving Apple the benefit of the doubt here and, and giving them kudos good. and saying like, Hey, look, uh, that mid frame on the 15 pro may put yeah. a lot of the components on the display side, but it could be because that camera is so thick and we get right. that there are design trade-offs and stuff. Like that. Yeah. I, yeah. I just want them to, yeah, I, I like their reviews. I, I, I tend to peek at them a lot and, uh, you know, but I, I guess I just get paranoid in today's world where everything gets hyperbolic and once it's yeah. rewritten and redone, then all of a sudden it's like, you know, it gets blown out of proportion uh, sometimes. And you know, many people may pick this up secondhand as opposed to looking at the original write up from them in the first place. Yeah, for sure. Because I fix it's very uh, calm in its assessment, but somebody exactly. reporting on I fix it. Exactly. Know. They'll pick yeah. the piece for the headline. So, yeah. Well, folks, uh, if you got something to tell us about, if you're like, hey, uh, here's something that can help you understand a little more about this topic or that topic because you happen to work in that area, you got experience in that area, we love to hear from you. Uh, you can get in touch with us on so many platforms. Uh, we are at DTNS Show on X. Also on Mastodon, we're at the mstdn.social platform, at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, and DTNS Picks on Instagram and Threads. Look us up. Wherever fine social media is exchanged. OpenAI launched a new version of ChatGPT that you can prompt by speaking, and it'll talk back to you in, in a good way. OpenAI is rolling out a new text-to-speech model in its iOS and Android apps that created human-like audio from just text and a few seconds of sample speech. And it's actually very natural sounding. Uh, they give you five different voices. Another new feature lets everyone upload a picture and ask ChatGPT questions related to it. For instance, take a shot of a broken faucet and ask, how do I fix this? Or some food ingredients and ask, what can I make? You can use a, draw a drawing tool to help make the, your query clear, like circling a part of the image, uh, for example. 
The new features are coming to paying ChatGPT users first. Uh, you, you should see it over the next two weeks if you pay for the service. Everybody else, uh, all you freeloaders like me, uh, will get it soon after, according to the company. Uh, OpenAI is using the Whisper model for this. It provides text-to-speech and partnerships, too. In fact, Spotify is planning to make some use of this to translate podcasts into other languages. So they'll be using a model to do the translation of a podcast and then using this text-to-speech to keep the unique sound of podcaster voices. Now, again, OpenAI is not letting ed just everybody do this, uh, but they're working directly with Spotify on particular uh, podcasts uh, to do this. This this is uh, this is what everybody wanted when when they got tired of of Chat GPT's when you know when they got over the newness of Chat GPT it was like right. why can't I just talk to it well now you can right and I, I the one thing that stood out to me the most is is this a precursor to all the phone manufacturers just saying okay we're done with our own assistant uh, <laughs> it it mm-hmm. this is going to be the next thing for us uh, a la my my baby girl Cortana is gone now, so uh, it it just it just makes sense to me to to you know, expand this. Yeah, yeah, I think I think a lot of people were wondering if this would replace Amazon, if it would replace Google Voice, would it replace Siri? Uh, when you think about it, though, Amazon's partnering with Anthropic, right? We heard about that in the quick hits. So uh, Amazon's you going to do this, but they're going to do it with a different company. Uh, Google has its own, right? They have Bard and 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 all of their own yeah. la- large language models. So they're also doing it with Google Assistant, just on their own. Apple, being Apple, secretly, uh, reportedly has their own large language models being developed. It doesn't sound like they've bought anyone specific, but they they have bought smaller companies in the past, so they've cobbled something together. Uh, that leaves Microsoft, which is the one using OpenAI's products. Yep. And it and it makes me think that the reason you lost Cortana, Chris, is because they knew this was in the pipeline and they're like, well, we don't need to do that anymore. We're going to have this. Right. Which would make perfect sense. Um, if they rename it to Cortana, uh, extra points for you. For oh, yeah. them. Bring her back. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the use cases they presented here also make sense. And I, I think uh, I, I find it to be pretty good. Uh, for, you know, for cooks in the kitchen that uh, maybe are feeling uninspired, why not, you know, grab a bunch of stuff and say, what can I make with this? Um, on the flip side, I hope it's, you know, it's an honest thing and say, no, your ingredients are trash. <laughs> There's nothing you can make. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, the, that use case is awesome. I, I've used image search. I've definitely seen something that looked like the most killer wasp on earth. So, you know, I would definitely like, hey, chat GPT, am I in danger <laughs> with this image? Um, you know, if this thing gets me, am I, <laughs> do I need to rush to the am hospital? I, am I finished? <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. Um, I, I, I was thinking search and, and recognition and stuff like that. And I was glad Joanna Stern brought up these other examples that you mentioned, you know, like, hey, this hose is, is hosed. <laughs> yeah, right. How do I fix it? Right. Uh, you know, again, uh, you do want to have a little more confidence in the veracity of the advice that the the large language model is giving you. Uh, but if it can say like, oh, yeah, I know what that here's here's the part you need. And here's a video that will walk you through how to fix it or or I can just walk you through how to fix it. Here are the steps. Yeah, I, I, I think that's great. And it is it is interesting that OpenAI is pitching this as uh, chat GPT can now hear talk and see because it can see the images yeah and i could definitely see uh opportunity uh, even when uh, rod and i are doing some woodworking uh, sometimes you know we fully switched over uh to uh, away from the uh imperial and we went metric because mm. it is that much it is just way simpler and i started too late in life to go figure out what five sixteenths and all of that foolishness looks like <laughs> um and we were building a table here uh, a workbench and off and we needed specific specifications uh, for it because we were mimicking one that already existed and we asked a, a Siri and she struggled now to be fair bar did find the answer mm-hmm. uh, for the dimensions of the top but you know being able to you know take something like that and then go a little further and say okay now what should my cuts be you know yeah. accounting for you know, oh, yeah. thickness and material. These are the things that kind of resonate to me as as far as uh, something like this uh, goes. 
Well, uh, before before we wrap this up, uh, Joe did record a little bit of what Joanna Stern demonstrated in the Wall Street Journal. So let's let's listen to that because I think it is impressive how natural it sounds. It was. It was about how we can talk to each other now. That's a compelling topic. The evolution of AI and its ability to communicate in more conversational ways has changed how people interact with technology. It's not just about getting information anymore. It's about engagement, conversation, and sometimes even companionship. So that that first voice was Joanna's, in yeah. case you didn't know. Uh, she also sounds very natural because as I've met her. She's a real human. Uh, but that, that second voice, that's pretty natural. Yeah, that it's, was pretty it, good. A little something that that tips me off knowing, but maybe if I didn't know, I wouldn't recognize it. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Well, NASA's seven-year OSIRIS-REx mission has returned to Earth. It landed Sunday carrying a bunch of rocks and dust from a near-Earth asteroid called Bennu. Uh, yeah, for the first time, we sent a robot out to an asteroid to scoop up some dirt and bring it back. Capsule touched down in the desert at the Department of Defense's Utah Test and Training Range with around 250 grams of material. NASA says it contains some of the oldest rocks in our solar system, and they're going to use that to help scientists understand just what things look like in the solar system, you know, four and a half billion years ago, whether organic material necessary for life appears elsewhere. Is it common elsewhere in the solar system? And we also may be able to tell if the water on Earth originated on asteroids like Bennu, because that's one theory is that asteroids carrying water crashed into Earth and created the oceans here. And if the ions are the same uh, in any water they find in this dirt on from Bennu, then that would be a pointer towards that being true. Yeah, I just got one question. I need them to figure out all the materials that are on that planet because I want to know what I can craft <laughs> when it comes to, if I land there and, and uh, farm some materials. Can I craft a nice spaceship or something out of it? Now, this is really, really cool. Where are you getting this idea from, Chris? I just I wonder. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, and all joking aside, uh, the inspiration for the video games is the is the the real idea of right. going to an asteroid and mining it to you know to help either bring materials back to Earth or create things in space so that you don't have to spend the money to launch them into space. Not to mention if they find some type of material that can benefit you know cell phones or something like that, then we don't have to you know, go into some of these crazy areas and, you know, just take up every piece of resources in these areas. I'm, yeah, I'm all for these type of things. Yeah. Yeah. And if they find some unobtainium out there, you know, I mean, why not? Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? All right. Let's check out the mailbag on our bonus show for patrons, uh, which in free preview week, you're all getting this week. Uh, last week, uh, we uh, looked at old tech news lineups from 10 years ago. We noticed a reference to text stops in New York, places for people to pull over and safely text. Now, we wondered 10 years later, whether those are still here. And Matt has a confirmation for us. Matt wrote in, while I don't have a picture handy, I can assure you the text stop areas still do exist in New York. It's an inside joke with my wife and I that whoever is driving, the other one will say something like, "Hun, can you pull over in two miles? I need to text. <laughs> uh, Mike's going to try to grab a picture of it the next time uh, he goes by. You, I don't know if you've ever been driving up in New York and seen these yourself, Chris. I have not driven up since these were created. I've, I've driven to New York many times, but of course. I, yeah, but uh, I haven't seen uh, not, not since these type of things, uh, been created. It's been, it's been some time since I've been up there. So I, I wonder if it looks like, uh, you know, the sit and wait at the airport. <laughs> yeah. I think they were already like, they were rest stops and pullouts and, and things like that, that they just kind of added a sign. Like here's a place where you can pull out and text, stop and text, stop and text. Yeah. Uh, we had a great discussion the other day about subtitles as well in our expanded show on Friday. Uh, and Marianne, uh, Dr. Marianne Gary wrote in and said, I've attached a paper here showing that subtitles 
help most of us in a wide variety of situations. My own experience is like Tom's. I feel as though subtitles are attention magnets and I miss some of what I would otherwise see or hear, but I'm not sure if the actual data match up with what that with that feeling or if it's just a feeling. Subtitles have a dark side too. My lab just submitted a paper in which we rapidly made people think they had learned some Danish and could apply it to various situations just by showing them subtitles. So, so the paper she did uh, showed people the, the video in Danish with English subtitles and then showed some people the video in Danish without the subtitles uh, and then compared whether people thought they were better at understanding Danish and then tested them on it. Turns out the people who saw the subtitles thought they were better at understanding Danish, but they weren't. Hilarious. That is that is a great little quick study to, yeah. to see, see how arrogant people are. I read something. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, Chris, my friend, it's great having you along uh, to talk about the stuff to help people understand technology better. Uh, what have you got going on? I know you you made some allusions to cutting boards and meat and, and recipes earlier. Tell us about Barbecue and Tech. Yes, Barbecue and Tech Season 5 is still going on real strong. Folks, come check us out if you want to learn how to become a backyard pit master. We kind of walk you through like the basics of, of smoking and just out of your backyard. Forget all the technical stuff that you hear like on these uh these big pit masters using we're just telling you how to do it in your backyard and give your friends something good to eat fantastic makes me hungry every time i hear an episode and i try never to miss an episode so you folks should check it as well bbq and tech.com as i mentioned a couple of times it's free preview week all this week we're giving everyone access to the Good Day Internet Extended Show. So stick around for GDI. We're going to discuss the Washington Post guide to phone call etiquette. Uh, it's more than just you should text before calling. Voicemails are dead, people. Uh, we're going to talk about that <laughs> and more. Uh, not just for patrons, though, for everyone, whether you're at patreon.com slash DTNS or not. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. Find out more about that at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with John C. Dvorak as our guest. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> All right, folks, get those uh, title suggestions in at showbot.tv slash DTNS2 if you're watching or listening live. Uh, we got some good ones in there, and we're going to choose one thanks to your submissions and votes. Again, if you're in the Discord or you're in the Twitch chat. So did you read this Washington Post article by Heather Kelly, Chris? Yeah, I did check it out. And while I mostly agree with it, little pieces or nuances but she did point out that you know depending on your age and your, mm -hmm. your you know your use cases that there are exceptions to the rule um the article is called the new phone call etiquette so uh, acknowledging this is new uh text first and never leave a voicemail when is it okay to leave voicemails call multiple times in a row or take a call in public uh the answer to those last two is never according to, <laughs> to heather kelly uh let, let's go with leave a, don't leave a voicemail uh kelly argues that people don't listen to voicemails anymore and if they acknowledge them at all they're probably reading some kind of voice to text transcription which may or may not be accurate so I'm going to, this is my area of disagreement because okay. most phones now do have visual voicemail. And so you can leave a message. The person doesn't have to call anybody. They don't have to do anything. They can literally just hit a play button. And oftentimes I've found it to be super beneficial because somebody will call and leave an important message uh, about my mother or my brother, but my wife is the one who handles the medical side of our family stuff. So mm. I will forward that exact voicemail to her and I can forward it to her into WhatsApp or email or, you know, within, you know, a text message. And then that way I don't have to relay the data that is left in the voicemail. So this is my uh -huh. small uh -huh. thing is where, uh -huh. Uh -huh. where people have visual voicemail. I don't find this to be a problem at all. 
So, so Kelly did to her, you know, to, to give fair credit, say that exceptions exist. Yes. She talked more about like, oh, if you just want to hear a loved one's voice because you're far away or whatever. Um, I feel like what you're describing is another kind of exception of like, yeah. oh, this is important information and it's being communicated in this way and it's faster and easier to, to pass yeah. it along. Yeah. Yeah. Her, her exceptions were spot on. You know, a daughter calls, my daughter calls me, leave me voicemails all day long. I'm happy to hear her voice, you know, my yeah, wife, right. stuff like that, you know, uh, bill collectors. Yeah. Not so much. So don't leave my <laughs> voicemail. I'm not trying and to hear I, you. I think <laughs> just, just regular, I think probably what she was talking about in the majority is you call somebody doesn't pick up and in in the olden days we'd say like uh hey chris it, it's tom just give me a call back right you know you don't need to do that exactly you can tell who it is you don't need to leave a voicemail to say that anymore 100 percent. that's why i said it's a slight area yeah, of, yeah, yeah. uh i don't even want to say disagreement just a little turn there it was like you know visual voicemail definitely a excellent exception but yeah don't yeah don't leave me a voice message tell me to call you back i clearly even just looking at a missed call means i'm going to call you back uh text before calling we've talked about this a bunch uh over the years the the, the new normal of of sending someone a text saying hey are you free to talk i, I want to give you a call and then and then folks uh are negotiating that and how i i occasionally will just call someone and apologize like i'm sorry i'm just calling you, but I'm generation X. Please forgive me. <laughs> so for me, I'm never doing that. I'm never, I'm too lazy to text somebody. If I'm going to text mm -hmm. you, I've, it's text all the way. Um, the only use case that where I will send a message is professionally, right? Because you never know somebody's in a meeting uh, or wrapping okay. up a meeting or something like that. So definitely on teams, I'll be like, Hey, can I, can I hit you up or something like that? Um, because the conversation is longer than what, what I want to type. But uh, so if it's a personal friend of mine and you're listening right now, you're never getting that courtesy ever. <laughs> <laughs> I also like that she, she made a point of saying, don't just text, call me like just the words call me because that sounds like there's an emergency and I definitely agree with can that. be nerve wracking. Definitely can yeah. be nerve wracking. So, and that one is context as well, because you know, eh, my friends know that, uh, if, if you test me, call me, it's, it's just that if there's an emergency behind it, you're, you're just going to call me directly anyway. So, but that, yeah. but yeah, hundred percent. Now the flip side of texting before you call is this one. Uh, Kelly says you don't need to answer the phone. I think the reason a lot of people text before they call is they're like, well, I don't want the person to feel like they have to pick up. And Kelly's like, you don't, if there's a call comes through, you don't have to answer it. Uh, if you're in the middle of something or in an inconvenient situation or you're talking to someone else, let it let it go and then send a text to explain, hey, I couldn't pick up right then. Call me back in a little bit or I'll call you back in a little bit. I've definitely had that play out where I called mm -hmm. someone hung up because they didn't answer. And then they text like, hey, in the middle of something, but I'll call you in 10. Right. And, yeah. and I, I think this is important for people to understand is that the part of the reason that we didn't need to text before calling is there was no expectation that you'd pick up if you couldn't talk. Right. I, I'll say this. If you're a friend of mine and I call and you don't pick up, you're immediately on my list. Okay. Answer the really? phone. Okay. So you're the I, part of the problem here. I am the absolute <laughs> problem. <laughs> I get totally annoyed when I call somebody and don't answer the phone. Uh, certain people, I, I would say not everybody in my life, but certain people in my life, you see my call you better answer the phone and it better what be if, a good What reason. if they immediately text say, oh, sorry, I'm driving or, oh, I, I'm talking to my wife right now. Couldn't pick up. Does that I, make you feel any better? Or is I'm ashamed to say no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at least you're honest, Chris. <laughs> I, 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 I am slightly less annoyed, but I uh -huh, to uh -huh. <laughs> I'm kind of with, kinda with <laughs> Chris on that because – calling for me is like it's not be my wife will make like a, a friendly call to friends and family like long-term friends just to talk mm -hmm. i don't mm -hmm. do that so yeah. the only time i call you is something like your house is burning and you haven't picked up on your text so i'm calling you and it, it kind of see the thing what i noticed is a lot of what she wrote for me is contextual it's based on sure who the recipient is is it sure. a 
and it's she acknowledges that yeah. in, the, in the article. Um, too, yeah. But like, also generational. Like, if my parents call and leave a voicemail, I, that's the only way they're gonna, they're not going to text me, right? My my yeah. dad can barely type, you know, well on a computer keyboard, let alone you know. Right, a, it is definitely screen. situational. That's a good yeah. Um, but you know, with with you know, it, it's interesting because I do agree with her. Like on voicemails, you don't leave important details and expect that as the only contact for all that information unless uh, it's something uh-huh. like you, you know like like for example with the school calls me about my kids it's like hey this is the school nurse blah 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 your daughter has blah 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 um please call back uh when you know please call back and that's it and, and then they'll explain the, further yeah, yeah. yeah yeah but like if you leave all this like intrig because when i had to deal with real estate agents back in the 2010s that was like a huge thing they would leave uh, on almost like a, a sixty second, like we found this house. So I'm just like, yeah, you let me call notes. you. Notes. They got to like, stop hey, watching. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let, let me just call you, and then we'll sort out because five of these I probably don't want to be in. Uh, home. But but so. since both of you are in the camp of if I'm calling you, it's important. Not yes. everybody is like that. No. So, no. so obviously some people know that. But yeah. what if I'm what if I know that? I know that if Roger and Chris are calling me, it's important and I better pick up, but I can't talk. Yeah. So you know the I think the addition of the automated uh response text messages that the, a lot of these phones have now, fantastic feature because while I am still annoyed. Uh, it is, at least I know you acknowledged that I called, right. which is it's part not, of not it. just ghosting I'm, on you. Right. Yeah. You didn't just ignore me because I was unimportant. Uh, so at the moment for you, so uh, that, that has made that process a lot easier. I get, you know, all those all the time. Most of my friends are in meetings or stuff like that. So it does, it does make it easier to say, Hey, I'm in a meeting or can I call you right back or something like that for sure. Uh, um, I just, you know, I just feel I'm too important to, to, to my friends. <laughs> so let me ask the both of you, do you find people tend to ghost you more on text or if you call? Like, I often find I people don't respond to my text as readily as if well, I I called. almost never call anyone, so I have almost zero data yeah. on, on that side of it. But, but I do notice there is a generational, she doesn't talk about it in this article, there is a generational difference between acknowledging a text and not. The younger a friend of mine is, the more likely they are not to respond to a text that I send. And if I ask them about it, like, oh, yeah, I saw it. <laughs> and like, I didn't think I needed to respond. I read it. My <laughs> wife, I am guilty of that exact thing with my wife as well. She definitely sent me something informational. And I'm like, acknowledged in my head. <laughs> but I'm yeah. just like, did you see a message? Yeah, I saw it. I read it. Yeah. It's like, oh, but, you needed a response? <laughs> but that, that's why we use the letter K, like, you know, K. Another yeah. pet peeve. Yep. I hate the letter K. God, what's going on? Some people think feel I'm the like worst that's in the disrespectful, pin. yeah. Yeah, just give me okay. It's not that hard to How hit hard O as well. <laughs> you know, I understand all the short form texts and all. Just give me, just give me uh, an O in front of it, okay? It's just, no, it's, I, I have a, a friend who... It may or may not co-host a book podcast with me that I'm constantly like, I sent I sent you this important information. Did you get it? She's like, Yeah, I got it. I read it. I'm like, How did I know you read it? And the only reason it's important for you to know that they read it or not is that there have been times when they missed the text, right? Right. And, text, right. and that's natural. Texts get lost. You know, yep. people get a lot of text and it gets marked it red and then they forget about it. So I'm just making sure. That's, and that's everybody turns off read receipts. So you can't tell it that way either. Well, I love WhatsApp because it does give you that double check to say it'll give you one to say it was received and then it colors it in uh-huh. when uh-huh. they've actually read it. So I'm like, OK, they read it. That is helpful. Yeah. But that is the double edged sword, right? Because now you're on the clock. <laughs> I mean, if you if you need right. to get a hold of your attorney and I'm using every method of that man is made. That's different. Yeah, that's a yeah. professional situation. I yeah. agreed. Yeah. A uh, few other things she mentions in this article. Emotions are for voice. Facts are for text. So it, it, the, to explain a little bit, and, and she does a good job of explaining it in her article, she's saying, look, and this is to your point, Roger, about the 60 second real estate voicemail. Like if you just need to tell me a list of things, email it or text it. 
you don't need to read it to me. It's it's hard to access that on voice. But if you need to tell me something or get across an emotion or you just want to hear my voice or whatever, that voice is good for that. I would add to this voice is good for explanation, right? If I'm if I'm texting back and forth with someone and it's starting to feel like this is too complicated to explain in text, I will say, hey, can we pick up the phone? Yeah. Because sometimes you just need to talk in real time to work stuff out and it's faster that way. For sure. Um, and for me, uh, you know, I have a bunch of chat groups on WhatsApp and I use voice in like I'll see something that happened and the sto- I need them to understand how funny what it is that I'm telling them. And uh-huh. there's no way it's going to come across in text. So that's one of the uh, use cases for me when I'm sending a voice message because I need them to hear the complete joy that I'm having first, whatever foolishness that I just saw. And then the other thing is when I'm driving, but I, I, you know, I don't necessarily want to fool around with uh, text, uh, voice, uh, speech to text. I just Mm -hmm. record my message and send it so that you can, you know, just hear it. And I'm, you know, not going to crash my vehicle. So yeah, those are my use cases, but I think she's spot on with what she's saying here as well. Also tell me what you think of this one. Don't repeat messages unless it's an emergency. So if you text someone and they don't respond, you can be annoyed, but don't text them again. Did you get it? Did you get it? Did you get it? Or (laughs) do the thing where you text and then you call and then you send an email. Like again, unless, unless there's a a reason for it, unless it's important and it's like, no, your house is on fire. I need you to to get back. (laughs) I I would agree with that. Um, You know, again, me and my friends, that that goes a bit differently. Uh, the, The message is the message. You'll never get the message again, but what you will get is some of the worst words <laughs> you've ever seen in a message if you don't respond to the original message. And you're like, what, what? Scroll up. That's what you get in my group. So <laughs> you never get the message again. So I agree with her. I think w- this is an in her article. One of my pet peeves is, did you get my email? Did you get my text message? Hmm. Why? Why does that bother you? It bothers me because I'm like, well, you need a response from me to that message. So either I didn't get it and didn't respond, or I did get it and didn't think I needed to respond, <laughs> or I got it and I, meant, and I mean to respond, but I haven't responded yet. And I get a lot of emails from yeah. a lot of people. And so a lot of times it'll be like, well, I got an email from you, but is it the one you're talking about? Maybe you right. sent me another one because I, I didn't think I needed to respond to that one. I hear so you. I feel like it's better to say like, hey, I emailed you about X. Yeah. You know, I, w- I wanted to see if, if you know, if you had an answer yet or et cetera. That is 100% fair. I never thought about it in that context because that's common uh common wordplay even at work <laughs> for me it's like yeah you get my i get the call hey did you get my email about you know this particular customer if it's a gotten about that's fine yeah yeah uh, yeah mo- plenty of times about 50 50 i would say but mm-hmm. i've never had it like it, that's not that never made it to my pet peeve where i'm like N- yeah i got your email fool all six of them <laughs> so well, tell yeah. me which one you're talking about which one like, yeah. i can totally understand where you're coming from on that though I'm probably overreacting on that one. I'll admit. Um, Stay still on video calls. (laughs) This one feels more like a family thing. I I don't run into this in work situations, but you know, the sort of like you're making a video call and people are walking around and they're swaying in and out. I don't know that this one bothers me though. This does not bother me. Not one bit. I, and in fact, I prefer the walking around because it feels way more conversational to me. Mm -hmm. Um, if I'm walking around doing things like, oh, spot on here, let me show you this thing that I'm working on real quick. Okay. Flip back to my face and, you know, expressions, it just doesn't bother me at all. I mean, especially if it's phone to phone, more often than not, I'm not looking at the screen anyway. Like I just kind of have it up and then I'm Mm -hmm. talking, but I'm not like, oh, let me, let me look into your eyes as we converse over. You know, are you, uh, but questions. are you the person who's got only half their face on the screen? <laughs> no, I'll usually have my chin or I'll have like something that I'm like doing. Like I, it depends on my, the condition of, uh, of my personal being. Like if I just woke up and I you, got But bad. you frame, you frame it on purpose is what, yeah, is yeah. what you're saying. 
Yeah. Roger says he has a great chin and he's going to lead with and it. He's gonna, yeah, he's gonna show it. <laughs> uh, lead with that chin. I I think this makes all the difference on the context to me. Like if it's a work thing or a class or something, then yes, yeah. everyone's day is still. Uh, I do agree with it there. Yeah. This one, I feel like it doesn't bother me as much as I think it should, which is people using speaker phones in public. I am 50-50 on this one because yeah. it, it really depends on the conversation, right? Uh, you know, if you pull up and you hear you know, the the argument with the family members, like, yo, put your window up. Definitely not trying to hear that. Um, <laughs> I've also it's pulled also up. kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely have pulled up and heard the, the spicy conversation like, oh, uh -huh. do tell. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. So, yeah. So that's not something that overly bothers me unless it's the conversation is just like, and I don't get uncomfortable very often, but if it's just like, I, I don't want to hear your business. Come on. You know, so I, I, I so this is definitely context driven. I, I, it doesn't bother me, but I've always wondered for the other person, like, doesn't it feel kind of odd to be airing out whatever personal matter you have to a bunch of strangers? <laughs> Like it to well, me that to just me it's great. no more it's no different than someone having a conversation with another person in person on the street, right? Like it depends on what they're talking about. If they're talking about it in a in a, in a, a loud way about personal stuff, it's like, ooh, that's kind of weird that you're talking about that out loud. So the speakerphone is the same. If it's just someone going like, yeah, okay, I'll be there at five o'clock or whatever, that doesn't bother me at all. If yeah. it's a spicier conversation. <laughs> I don't know. It might, it might be entertaining, right? But to me, I, it's if you're if it's out on the street, it's no different than people talking on the street with all the same caveats totally. around talking on the street. It bothers me if it's like, oh, we're in a quiet, we're you know, we're in a yeah. situation where yeah. we're like yeah. in a cafe where everybody's working on a it's, train. And again, it's no different than a loud conversation with a real with a person in front of you that way. I will tell you the place that it does actually get to me, and that's in the uh, airport at the waiting to get on the plane. Those. Oh, yeah. Those speakerphone conversations, because I'm normally like in a completely day state because as soon as I hit the chair, I'm going to sleep. And if somebody's got some crazy, you know, conference call going on and they think everybody needs to know the numbers of their company, you know, that, so that's probably the only location that it bugs me. But I think the next time I hear a conversation on a speakerphone that bugs me, I'm just going to pull out a paper and a pencil and start taking notes and see what they do. <laughs> <laughs> or just start recording them with your phone. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> keep going, keep going. <laughs> this is great data. You, Adobe, you work for Adobe? Is that right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's weird because like I've always been sort of discreet in public conversations to begin with, unless it's something about, sure. yeah, I don't want to eat there, like where everyone's discussing where to eat. Yeah, you know, right. if it's like a personal matter, I don't know about you, but usually like drag someone aside and you kind of bring down your voices if it's like, you know, a serious personal matter. Right. Um, you know, because it just feels weird for everyone to be listening to it for me. I, it's funny. Uh, we were in a, an airport lounge uh, on our way out on our trip. Uh, and, a, and a woman took an interview in the lounge. Now she wore headphones, so we weren't hearing the other end of the conversation, but we were definitely hearing her, you know, make her pitch for herself at everything. And I appreciate the hustle. Yeah, yeah. It was I I I was like it should be quieter in here. This really isn't the place for you to do this. But I don't know. It 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 didn't bother me. Again, it didn't bother me as much as I thought I would have thought it would have before yeah. it happened. Yeah. But what's uh to... final one here, screen your calls. Screen call screening is back now that we have phones. The iPhone does it now. Android's done it for a long time. Uh where you can let the let the phone answer the call for you and see a transcript of what the person on the other end yep. is saying, and then you can decide whether to pick up or not. Uh, yeah, I think uh, any measure because of how bad uh, robocalls and stuff have have gotten mm -hmm. over the years, um, you can take uh, do not disturb, uh, do not call dot gov, uh, where you can register your phone number uh, for telemarketers. Um, certain ones don't count, uh, of course. Uh, call screening uh, for AT and T. It's a AT and T. Uh, well, it used to be called AT and T Call Protect, but I think they changed it to something else. All of these apps and things that you can use to, like, you know, block numbers uh, or just you know send them to 
something else first, that by all means, take take advantage of that. Because what I'm hoping is that there becomes a shared database <laughs> where, uh, you know, everybody can just block everybody and put an end to, the, you know, a lot of this foolishness. So I would agree. Now, me personally, most of the calls I do block, but every once in a while, I got time. I always feel that if it's a call, if it's a phone number I don't recognize, all I'm doing, if I pick up the phone, is confirming this is a working number. Yeah. And I want to, I do not want to give them that. So I know I it's hear you. I have the same feeling to, to answer and waste their time. And I've seen some people make, make like a, a profession out of this or, yes, or even like yes. successful YouTube channels. And maybe that's a whole different thing, but I would prefer to just not confirm that that number works. So just let, I hear it, you. let it go. Unfortunately for me, I don't have that luxury to let every call go because oh, sure. you know, yeah, yeah. I have a, you know, a brother I'm taking care of and I never know if the phone, you know, if the, if the yeah, call is coming yeah. from something there. And, you know, I've been, I've like been in those situations too, where I'm like, well, I do need to answer this because I don't know who it is. I, yeah, yeah. Right. And it could be something. Mm -hmm. So, but when I have time, best believe <laughs> we, we're going to have some fun. <laughs> you might as well if you're gonna be answering it anyway just in case then that makes then i guess that makes sense to me right like do tell about your uh little plan here oh really and how did you come oh, across that oh my wow. email is locked it's, with oh. can you send me the key can you send it in the mail like the regular mail oh you want is me to go physical key <laughs> right do you want me to go buy a gift card man i'm broke as a joke i don't oh, even got gas money to get there can you send me five dollars <laughs> so i can get there there you go <laughs> i don't have a phone but but, but you're yeah <laughs> oh man it's it's funny how how fast a phone number well it's not even how fast it's phone numbers are in all phone numbers are in the system now because these a lot of these these places that spam with texts they just create random numbers they're not even pulling numbers from a database right this they're just sending it to random numbers and knowing that some of them won't go anywhere but enough of them will so when i got my e-sim when i was traveling uh -huh. turned on that new international phone number right and I, within a day i was getting i was getting spam text messages that is nuts yeah. One day we'll have to compare like the, the most creative scam text message uh, or email that you, we, we've all ever gotten. Because there have been some good ones where I'm like, whoa, that's really good. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. D d yeah. Paolo DLR, the, the, the messages were in Korean because that was a Korean phone number. So they were assuming because it was a Korean phone number, the person on the other end was Korean. So all in Hangul. Um, I think these are overall a pretty good assessment of the current state. What I don't know is because things have changed rapidly on phone etiquette in the past 10 to 15 years, whether this is going to last, like how long is this going to be the etiquette or is it going to continue to evolve? Yeah, I, I think she absolutely wrote a fantastic article here. So this, this was a really fun conversation and in fact i have a friend who i always have to cringe before i call because of much of the little nuances that i have he absolutely despises anybody calling him directly and so you know when i call him for something something he, he immediately he's on guard like what do you want why are you texting me <laughs> and it's still, i just have to laugh sometimes because i know i'm annoying him by calling but i you know this is a conversation that needs to be had over the phone so i think she really laid it out perfectly here yeah i i have a feeling in the future it'll just be some sort of virtual avatar assistant that will answer the call for you and it will be just at least 80 percent of you that can you know, be like a chat bot. And oh, but that questions. becomes an etiquette thing, right? Like, Hey, why aren't I on your approved list to let me through the avatar? Why do I always have to talk to your avatar? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why is your avatar dancing? Can you have an avatar that's more serious <laughs> in the beginning? <laughs> oh, right. Is it? Yeah. Which avatar do you show to your work colleagues versus your, your friends? Uh, I don't know. I, I feel like this stuff's going to continue to evolve uh, and it's and it's going to continue to change. But this, like you said, I think this is a uh, this is a pretty good list. As strange as it may sound for somebody who does a podcast where I talk for a living, I hate talking on the phone. I really do. 
If I can well, avoid I, being on the phone, I do. I if there's something about talking on the phone I find so taxing compared to like talking, even even a teleconferencing call. There's something about holding the phone to your head and having to talk that way and then concentrate on the conversation in a way that I normally don't. You can just do, do headphones then. You don't yeah, have to. There's something about not being able to see a face. See the other person. Yeah. 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 yeah so like, I can't I'm, uh, judge. judge I don't mind at all. I uh, Talking on the phone, uh, depending on the person, you know, the one that drones sure. on. It, yeah. But for the most part, I don't mind talking on the phone. I'm just a speakerphone guy at home. So mm-hmm. when my boys call me, we're, you know, chopping it up. I'll just throw you on speakerphone um, unless I can't, you know, so. And it, it Definitely matters who's calling me. There yeah. are people who call me where I'm like, oh yeah, I don't mind talking on the phone to them. Right, right, um, right. But but like when it's like, oh, I gotta call somebody to to get this done or or ask about this. That, that's the ones I hate. And yeah. understandably strangers. so. Yeah. All right, folks, uh, we are glad to have you along. Thanks to everybody who supports the show at patreon.com slash DTNS. If you're enjoying the free preview week already, uh, by all means, get in there and enjoy more. We got lots of folks interacting with us over there. Enrique liked uh, the post of the Know a Little More episode about the computer mouse. Fakey Nosegrub just liked Roger's column uh, about heat and electronics. Uh, we've got some comments from Russell, lots of good comments regarding last Friday's show in there as well, talking about subtitles and different ways that, that people use them and, and enjoy them. Thank you to Maria and Riley, uh, and Raymond in there. Thank you for, uh, for all your comments. Appreciate that. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Thank you folks supporting us on Twitch. J round 20 resubscribed for the 48th month. Mm. Amazing that it's been four years of giving you someone else's hard-earned money. Keep up the great work. Of course, referring to the fact that if you have an Amazon Prime subscription, it's no additional cost to send a little money our way. Uh, PC Miles, Ian Pele, Glendale, Zoe Brings Bacon, Technomench all gave us bits. Lord Itchy, 73, 49th month. Quicksilver gave us a follow. Lord Mulgar cheered us with 101 bits. And Rabbit41 with some bits as well. That's going to do it for Good Day Internet. Thanks, everybody, for being with us. Hope you're enjoying free preview week uh, if you're not already a patron. And you can become one at patreon.com slash DTNS. Talk to you soon. See you later, Internet. Have a good day.